Okay, thanks very much, Caroline. Welcome everybody to the launch of the third version of the PK tool. Uh, so we have put up a small poll for you to have a look at, um, which will be useful for me to know just how much um, background people have got in the PK tool. So what we're going to do today is uh, put up this splash screen so that you orient you on the uh, Zoom. But I shall move on to the next. Um, so do feel free to put uh, any questions, comments on the chat, because at least for the first part of um, the presentation, we're going to have everybody in mute. So let me move on to the next slide. So I'm going to go through um, just a quick introduction to the, the cheat sheet and where to go for more information. And then I'm going to focus initially on using the tool to make, um, to make predictions and simulations and ask what if questions and move fairly quickly to a demo of that. And then talk about um, calculating values for human PK parameters um, and a demo of that. And then we'll get into um, import and export and some uh, caveats and acknowledgements and also finish off with uh, the download and just orienting you to uh, installing it especially if you have any issues with firewalls and things like that so shall we end the polling now yeah. okay fab so most people have got some experience or have seen or aware of the existence of the PK tool, but um, haven't necessarily used it all that much, but a few have, so that's great, very helpful. Thank you. And so, moving on to the next slide. So in the PK tool, there is um, online help. So there's two forms. There's a quick start guide, which is a single page um, it's got quite a lot of text on, but it is just a single page. And then there's um, documentation, which is really just links to more information, including some of the previous videos, some of which are more in-depth um, theory discussions. And then there's, uh, there's the splash screen, etc. So I'll show you that in the demo as well. In terms of using the PK tool, so this is what the PK tool now looks like. It's fairly similar to version two for those of you that have seen that. Uh, so in the top left, you're looking at entering values for the different species, either in vitro or in vivo. And those values give rise to predictions for human. Um, the graphs summarize those uh, predictions for um, the absorption rate constant for volume and for clearance. And then the key numbers that are really used in the rest of the simulation are those in the middle of the screen here. And then you need to add some properties at the bottom left, and then you'll end up with a human dose prediction um, and a graph of the concentration over time. Um, so as I mentioned, there are two areas that you've got to make sure are populated, otherwise you're not going to get predictions. And I'm going to go through um, how you get these human PK parameter predictions and um, also uh, the different things you can do in terms of simulations. And actually, I'm going to start there because um, some of that is more of the new stuff in version three of the tool. So. Um, we're going to start with the with the with the values, and and the simplest way to demonstrate this is just to open a parameters file uh, with some test data in it, and and use that. So these values uh, that I'm talking about, which are in the middle of the screen, they're all uh, PK parameters, and they are um, the values in uh, their total. So they're not unbound, they're not corrected for plasma protein binding, although. Plasma protein binding has been taken into account in coming up with those numbers, which you'll see as we go through the talk. And then the additional values you need to put in, um, you need to put in, uh, importantly, a value for the efficacious concentration. You can do that in nagas per mil or in uh, millimolar. Um, the safety one actually isn't really used in the calculations at all. It's just 
um, an additional line which gets plotted on the graph here so you can get some idea if you have um, as a safety threshold in mind you can get some idea of how close the uh, plasma concentration gets to that safety threshold and then this um, third line down here is quite important it determines how the PK tool is going to uh, relate the plasma concentration over time to the efficacious concentration that you want to achieve and so we'll talk about that in a minute because that is one of the enhancements in version 3 and then you also need to put in obviously the dose interval in hours and the simulation time in days and the route of administration which is either oral or IV yeah and you'll end up with a human dose prediction and a concentration time graph so I mentioned the enhancement to um, how you relate the efficacious concentration um, to the, uh, the plasma concentration. So in version two and version one, the tool assumes that you want to achieve um, the efficacious concentration uh, as the minimum that the uh, plasma concentration reaches at steady state. So you can see here, there's obviously a drug which is um, giving a lot of accumulation. It's being dosed 12 hourly, and after a few days, it reaches steady state. And um, the blue line is, is signifying the efficacious concentration. And so the dose is calculated to ensure that you achieve this efficacious concentration um, at the end of, uh, by the time you got reached to a steady state. And the dose is calculated using this uh, rather scary looking equation. It's fairly uh, common. And so that was, that's version one and version two. In version three, we've added some other options. So in version one, this was the only option in version, uh, and, and version one and two, uh, that was the only option. In version three, you can also use um, CAV, which obviously is very trivially related to the AUC. Um, that's the idea of using CAV was one of the things that uh, um, Dennis Smith, a uh, consultant, suggested. Um, it may be familiar to many of you. And uh, so you can relate the CAV to, to uh, the efficacious concentration at steady state. Um, and also you can uh, relate the concentration at a particular time. So this might be particularly useful for single dose compounds in malaria, perhaps. So the idea was to be able to make it easier to, uh, to, to go through some of these scenarios, which are in this um, uh, paper by uh, Balakrishnan and um, pointing out that uh, for different drugs, this is, um, these are bacterial drugs, the relationship between uh, drug potency and uh, plasma concentration is not always um, simple and may be better explained by different things. So for example, in this case, by uh, the peak that the drug concentration reaches um, over the MIC, so Cmax over CF, and here by uh, the time above CF, and uh, finally AUC over CF. So we wanted to make it easier to put in these different options. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of some of that. So first of all, I will just go to um, what you will see when you've unpacked the zip file is that you get uh, an executable uh, for both Windows and for Mac. You get uh, README, which gives you more information on installing things. This is particularly useful if you can't just run executables that you've been sent and you need to um, run the PK tool from the Python source code, which you can do. So the README gives you information on doing that. Um, for Mac users, there's also a, a sort of small preliminary step. But for us Windows users, if you can just download the executable out of the zip file, then you can just double click on that and life is straightforward. So um, you will get as well as the PK tool coming up, you'll get a splash screen with terms and conditions, um, which essentially say it's uh, free and the source code's available. Um, if you make modifications, then you're expected to put the modified source in the public domain. Um, and I've managed to 
remove the button that agrees to those T's and C's. Okay, so I'm going to import a parameters file and there are some provided in the uh, zip file download. So here's one. I'll show you the format of it in a minute. Um, it tells you that it's successfully loaded. Uh, something else that's quite handy is that the name of the parameters file now appears at the top here. So you can keep track of which compound you're working on. And uh, I'll cut straight to um, calculating a, uh, a predicted dose and a concentration time graph. So just to um, show you that under the help, you've got the quick start guide, which is um, a one pager very dense, but does give you information on how to get at the values that you need to make calculation. Um, and this documentation, that gives you the links to more theory, etc. And then you've also got um, settings. If you're on different screen sizes, you might find it useful to increase or decrease the font size. Also, there are a lot of tool tips in this version in particular, and you may find it useful to hide some of them if you find them getting in the way of your screen, perhaps if you're on a smaller screen, um, some of them are quite um, wordy. So you can uh, turn them, toggle them on and off. Okay, so um, in terms of the results, I'm gonna, in this uh, demo, I'm gonna assume that we've got these predicted human PK parameters here, and we're going to use them to make some predictions and ask some what if questions and just explore um, manipulating the plot and things like that. So here's our human predicted dose. Um, we can manipulate the plot. We can use a log scale um, trivially. Uh, we can also zoom into different parts of the plot if we want to and blow those up and just go back and reset and that like that. Um, we can also use, um, we can plot the concentration as free drug or total. Um, so I mentioned that uh, one of the enhancements that we made is this ability to use um, different ways of relating CF to plasma concentration. So I'm going to use one of those to demonstrate um, one thing about the tool, which is the ability to plot multiple runs. So first of all, we're going to make the assumption, if you imagine this now might be useful for a malaria drug where we're looking for a single dose cure, so um, what we're saying is that we are, I'm going to simulate it over three days. So I'm going to say the dose intervals, no, 72 hours. I don't think it actually matters as long as it's longer than three days. Um, but uh, so it's simulation time for th three days. And we're saying here that uh, we have a hypothesis that it is necessary to maintain the plasma concentration um, at or above the CF for 24 hours. So um, if I now hit uh, calculate, then you can see we've got a three day simulation and uh, plasma concentration is hitting CF after uh, one day. And I can plot multiple runs on here. So I can now look at what would happen if this was, um, if we had the hypothesis that it was necessary to maintain the plasma concentration for two days then uh, you can see uh, we've done that and obviously the dose required has gone up and the concentration has gone up and we can do the same thing. We can say that it needs to be 72 hours and then I guess we'll get to see the dose go up quite a bit. Um, and what we can do is we could export this image as a PNG. Um, we could also uh, oh, one thing I should note is one another thing we've implemented in version three is it's possible to annotate your simulation. So um, that I find, <laughs> if you're anything like me, it's very helpful to keep some notes on um, what you have done. So uh, simulations, let's say the first one was for 24 hours. The second one was for 48 hours. And the third one was 72 hours. And then when we export the parameters that we've been working with, um, I'll do that and you can 
just overwrite that file. Um, that will show us all the parameters that we've saved to do with this simulation. You'll see lots of calculated properties as well as the input properties. And the other thing we can output is, um, as well as exporting this as a PNG file, we can export it as a concentration time, concentration time values in case we want to plot that in some other software. So let's export that. And um, for, I'll show you that one first. So we can open um, that concentration time. Uh, where are we? So if we x axis needs to be time, doesn't it? Okay, and then. We could color that, for example, um, by the predicted dose. So uh, we can explore um, just writing that out so we can plot it in different software if we want to. Um, the, the parameter file that I exported, I'll have a quick look at that. So At the top here, we've got uh, various system parameters to do with um, each species and uh, parameters like liver blood flow, liver weight, etc. These are experimental values that we've put in to do with um, in vitro experiments. And um, further down, we've got experimental values from in vivo experiments. Then further down still, we're recording information about the assumptions we've made in the simulation. I'm telling you this partly so you can see um, what comes out of the PK tool. Also, you can use this file as import. So this is the same format. Um, obviously, you might want to uh, interrogate some of this. So the other thing is you get far more calculated properties out than you used to. So you can see that we are um, outputting um, various uh, properties uh, that have been calculated. And then right at the bottom, the, uh, the notes that I made in making the PK tool um, in doing that simulation with three different time points, um, the notes are all output as part of the CSV file as well. Okay, so I think that's what I wanted to demo at this point. So I'll jump back to the slides and we'll talk about how we get a hold of um, these human uh, PK, predicted human PK properties um, that obviously are essential to make this, uh, these simulations. Okay. So where do the numbers come from? Numbers we're talking about are, are these. So we'll go through these um, in quite some detail. So uh, that's the equation. These are the different parameters. You can see that obviously quite a lot of the ones that we've been talking about are used in this uh, equation, which is why, why we need them, obviously. Um, so this is an overview of where those values are going to come from. And usually for most of these, you've got some options as to where you can get these parameters from. So uh, at if, if you're most desperate, if you don't have too much data, you can just click the edit box and you can put in values. And in fact, if you put in values for all of these, um, you will be able to get um, some simulations. So if these values are reasonable, that's fine. But these values can also be derived in other ways. And I'm going to talk about that now. So starting at the top, the absorption rate constant. Um, so this is the, the rate at which the drug is absorbed into the body. Um, and for us, uh, we're talking about oral dosing. So it's populated from the K value um, for the species upon which the allometry is based. So we're going to talk about allometry in a minute. Um, but whichever species you use, let's assume you've done some mouse PK, for example, and you're going to use your, that as your allometry. Um, if you've got a Ka value from the mouse PK, then that's the value that will be used here because uh, 
uh, in the allometry, um, it's assumed that Ka uh, is the same between different species. Um, there are ways if you don't, some people don't get this standardly from their PK experiments or the people that do their PK experiments for them. Um, there is a process by which it can be derived from that. Um, uh, certainly Xenologic called it curve stripping and there is some information on that in the theory slides. If you can't obtain it, um, using a value of one is a, is a reasonable start point and you might be able to guess based on the um, concentration time graph of your PK experiment, uh, whether it would be a roughly one or more or less. Um, so there are ways to kind of fudge it, uh, having a look at your concentration time graph. Um, it's, it's not usually, as I mentioned here, considered to be sensitive to the weight of the species. Okay, so moving on to the volume of distribution. Um, and so this is also gonna be populated from the volume um, for the value for the species on which your allometry is based and so you usually get this from an IVPK experiment and um, it's usually assumed to be uh, that the value per kilogram is usually assumed to be the same for different species in other words the uh, in the allometry the slope value is one and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute um, however if you are struggling because you're trying to make predictions for a compound for which you don't have um, PK, uh, which is, you know, tricky, but um, that's the world I guess we sometimes live in, then um, it's perhaps useful to know that acidic compounds often have low volumes, usually have low volumes, um, neutrals and bases somewhat higher, and at least um, for uh, some compounds they um, sometimes, uh, you know, for the same charge state, they might correlate to some extent with phys physicochemical properties, log P, log D. So using that might be a reasonable guess if you have no PK. PK is obviously better. Clearance. Now this is an example where really I think most people would agree that predicting clearance if you've got no experimental values for a compound is very difficult and unlikely to be very successful. So here is an example where you really do want some experimental data. Um, and in the PK tool, you can make human clearance predictions. Remember, these are all human values we're looking to predict in this uh, field here, in this um, section of the tool here. Uh, then we can use allometry or we can uh, do it from uh, in vitro measurements of microsomal or hepatocyte um, stability. So um, you can. Uh, I'll show you in a minute that you can use, um, if you've got uh, clint values, if your um, experimental folks determine clint values for you, you can use them directly in the PK tool, not, uh, or you can use um, half-life in the experimental setup to calculate the clint values. Um, when it gets to this point and you're doing a simulation uh, using the human predicted clearance. You can either use the clearance value or the half-life. Uh, obviously those things are related by this equation. We also need um, the free fraction in plasma because the PK tool is, uh, for example, using uh, the allometry is done with unbound drug. So um, we need to know the, uh, the free fraction in plasma. Again, within a series, this often correlates with the felicity. So again, if you don't have a measurement, uh, measurement on an analog and some knowledge of the log P or log D, especially if you've plotted uh, that relationship for several members of a series might give you a clue as to uh, how, what sort of guess to make. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about allometry and clearance in the PK tool. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, Allometry is based on this idea that a lot of properties associated with um, uh, animals uh, to do with metabolic rate, for example, um, scale with uh, the log mass. So log metabolic rate against log mass um, gives you something of a straight line. That theory has been around for a long time and, and is borne out, you know, plus or minus. Um, 
in the PK tool, uh, you can do single species allometry. That's to say you can do one species at a time. We're not taking an average of allometry from two or three species, but you can, in some ways, it's an advantage, I think, to be able to say, well, I'll do it from mouse and then I'll do it from rat and I'll see how big a difference I get. So by default, um, when you uh, use one of the uh, CSV files, the parameter files for input that's provided for you, the exponents are 0.75 for clearance. You can change that if you want to. Um, and you can also decide which um, species you're going to use to base the allometry on. And again, it's the unbound clearance that's scaled. So to do that, we're obviously going to need to populate the um, in vivo tab for the species for which you've got some PK with the experimental data. And then when that calculate button is pressed, um, we've been showing you so far, I've been showing you so far the human extracted tab, which gives you those graphs. Um, if you look underneath the species tabs, you get the calculated properties and these properties are all output. So here you've got the user data essentially um, transformed by, um, the, these are all unbound values. Um, so in the non-human tabs here. So um, the unbound clearance in this example is going to be 30 divided by 0 0.18 because that's the free fraction. So the unbound clearance is going to be 167 or thereabouts, similarly for the volume. So that's where those numbers are coming from and how they relate to the input parameters that you've put in there. As far as the graph is concerned, so for the graph, we need to adjust the unbound clearance for body weight. So for mouse here, we multiply by the weight of uh, standard uh, mouse. And so that gives us, um, in kilograms, that gives us a value of 3.3 .3 here. And you'll see that in a minute on the next slide uh, plotted on the graph. And similarly for volume, we've got 889. I mentioned here that K is not adjusted for binding. Um, so yeah, the, the other properties are, we're all talking about free um, values. So here's the, here's the graph showing the allometry that's going on here. So again, we're scaling from the PK experiment in the mouse to give us predictions for human. So uh, if we move over to the right hand side and the uh, clearance for uh, the mouse is plotted down here, so it's the weight of the mouse and the clearance per body now, not per weight, but per body, unbound clearance per body was 3.3 .3 as we calculated. Essentially, to get a prediction for human, we just plot, we just draw a straight line with the um, slope value of 0.75 till we get to 70 kilograms, the weight of a human, and that gives us the unbound clearance prediction for the human and that's for the whole body, so that's in mils per minute. Now to get back to um, the, the value that's going to be plotted here, which is in mils per min per kilogram, we need to adjust for the weight of the human, 70 kilograms, and we need to adjust for the fact that we're looking at uh, this, this value is total, not unbound. So we adjust for binding, the plasma protein binding measurement in human, which may be different from the species you're dealing in with. So that's how we get to this number 0.54 by using allometry. If we want to scale from a different species, um, so let's assume we've also got some PK data for rat, then uh, we can use that and um, we populate the tab here on the left hand side. This time we use uh, the pull down allometry from rat and uh, what you'll see is that the graph now goes through the blue cross which is the uh, clearance unbound clearance value for rat per body so that's moved where this pink uh, pink dot is just because uh, we've plotted a straight line with the same slope as before but now it's going through that point so that's going to modify the clearance values you can see it's it's got slightly lower 0.44 instead of 0.54 one thing that you might want to note is that if you look at the other species, so now if we go back to mouse, we've got two columns here, one for the user data, this is what we entered for mouse, and this is what the rat would predict for mouse, 
using allometry. So um, you get some idea about how these two things compare. And you can see that obviously visually from how close these two um, um, crosses are to the line. Okay, so allometry is not the only way to make a clearance prediction um, in the PK tool. And so we can also use uh, experimental measures from in vitro experiments on microsomes and hepatocytes. So again, on the top left, we're gonna be entering the um, data for uh, microsomes or hepatocytes. This is, I've got the human tab here. You can put values in for the other species. They're not used in making predictions for human, but they do show on the graph. So you can see how they relate to the allometric scaling. But if we're making predictions for human using um, hepatocytes and microsomes, then we're gonna be using uh, the human tab here and the human uh, heps and mics um, uh, determinations. So if you've got Clint values, then you can put them in here. If you haven't and you've got the half-life and you've got other parameters associated with the experiment, such as the microsomal protein concentration, um, and you need to talk to your person doing the experiment about um, things like the assumptions they make about the uh, the amount of uh, the microsomal protein concentration per amount per liver um, and other system parameters. So we provide some, but you know other um, pharmacokinetics people might use slightly different values uh, when they do their scaling. So if you enter the half-life and those experimental parameters set up, then um, the clint will be ca uh, calculated for you you can put Clint in, in either, um, uh, in this case, um, it would be um, milliliters per minute per um, mega protein, um, or we can put in the scaled values. Um, the one I'm showing you here is for hepatocytes. So similarly, we could put the half-life in, or we could put the Clint value in. And in that case, it would be um, microliters per min per million cells. And um, obviously we need, we still need the uh, free fraction in plasma. The other thing that is new about the PK tool here is that we've added the possibility to take account of binding in the microsomal experiment and the hepatocyte experiment. So if you have those values, you can put them in here and uh, the blood plasma ratio we put in here as well. So um, when you calculate, you're going to get um, the uh, clearance predictions uh, under the human in vitro tab um, will show you the different uh, values here. So for example, for hepatocytes, um, we give you this value in uh, lots of different ways, depending on how it's scaled. Okay. And also whether it's um, bound or unbound. Mentioned the um, FU plasma. Um, so that's uh, going to be the, uh, the experimental determination of human free fraction in plasma. Now, um, one more parameter that we need is bioavailability. Um, so this is usually determined from a uh, comparison of an IV and an oral uh, PK experiment. Obviously, we are trying to predict it for human, and we're unlikely to have a human PK experiment at this point when we're using the PK tool, I suspect. So we have to come up with a way of populating this, this box. It's not easy to predict. Um, obviously, if you set it to one, uh, that's the most optimistic scenario. You're assuming that your bioavailability is 100%. Um, based on Xenologic's uh, proposal, we've actually implemented uh, in version three uh, an enhancement which um, calculates the bioavailability, um, making an assumption essentially that uh, well, the, 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 this is a constant across um, species. So bioavailability is essentially a, a, an aggregate of the fraction that gets absorbed through the gut wall and the fraction that escapes gut metabolism and also the fraction that escapes um, first pass metabolism. And um, for in order to make uh, a prediction for bioavailability based on animal PK, we're going to make the assumption that this 
um, this particular property or this, this combination fraction absorbed times the fraction escaping gut metabolism is going to be a constant across all species. And that allows us to say that the bioavailability for human is the same as this bit for animal um, multiplied by uh, the fraction escaping first pass metabolism in human for which we should have a uh, an estimate because we are estimating clearance. So just to work that through, um, this is what goes on in the in the tool. So um, if we're comparing uh, mouse and human here, so um, you can see we've got uh, blood clearance and liver blood flow values, um, and we've got the experimental uh, value of bioavailability for the mouse. We're going to make a prediction for human using this approach. So uh, we're now using the same equation in order to um, uh, in order to calculate this value fa times fg for the animal we um, first of all have to calculate uh, the fh for the animal which we're going to do by one minus the blood clearance over liver blood flow so that's the fraction that's um, escaping uh, first pass metabolism so for this test data that comes up with 0.67 for the mouse and that gives us a way of determining this uh, this property that we need for this equation because we can use the bioavailability divided by this 0.67 fraction, which in this case for these experimental values for mouse would give us FA times FG of 0.5. So we can now plug that back into a prediction for the bioavailability for human. And uh, because we've got a prediction of clearance for human, uh, that gives us in this case a value of 0.47. So uh, essentially in putting in a value for bioavailability, you're probably going to want to use somewhere between one, which is your most optimistic, and whatever the bioavailability value is for uh, the particular animal you're using to do your uh, allometry. And um, the PK tool gives you a way to predict um, where that value might sit. Before we go into the demo for this part, just a word on um, if you're selecting using the PK tool to try to select compounds for efficacy studies, and in particular selecting uh, doses for, uh, for efficacy studies. Um, so obviously the tool is set up for human dose prediction, but you can get other species predictions uh, with a bit of work. Uh, so obviously you're in a situation probably where you have um, less information, sometimes much less information than you would have if you're trying to make a human dose prediction. Um, so obviously the predictions are going to be pretty uncertain, um, but in that world where we have to go with something, um, then what can we do? So uh, we've talked about um, these things to, to some extent, um, but we have to come up with numbers for all these values if you want to make a prediction for an efficacy study. So uh, KA, if you don't have a PK experiment, um, you can estimate it from analogs or, you know, in the worst case, I suppose, assume that it's one or try that, have a look at the concentration time plot in the tool and see how that relates to uh, what you've seen experimentally. Um, volume, uh, obviously you want to estimate it from allometry, um, but if you've got analogs and some idea of how the volume relates to lip felicity, you might be able to estimate it from that. Clearance, uh, you know, really, you're going to have to have some kind of estimate, at least from microsomes or hepatocytes, as we discussed. Um, FU plasma is another one that can correlate with lip felicity for uh, within a series, particularly for um, the same charge state uh, bioavailability we've just discussed. So, um, essentially, you're going to operate if you want to try and predict for uh, those for efficacy studies by manipulating the values in these boxes um, by uh, editing them where necessary. One thing to note, the clearance, um, now you're going to be using, obviously, normally you would use the uh, in vitro clearance for human. You're now going to use the in vitro clearance for um, the animal species and uh, because you, um, you you just want to uh, look at the animal species tab uh, 
and uh, copy the uh, total clearance value and, and paste it into this um, field here once you've uh, clicked edit. Last thing before a demo, um, I mentioned that one enhancement in version three is the ability to take account of the free fraction in hepatocyte experiments. We previously could do that for microsomes. Sometimes you don't have measurements for those things. Um, probably if you have measurements for other members of the series, you might be able to come up with an estimate based on the felicity again and a trend. There are also QSAR experiments that are published such as these where you need to know the log P or log D of the compound in question. And um, these QSAR experiments will give you estimates for the uh, free fraction in microsomes or hepatocytes. Okay, so a demo of all of that. So we're talking about how do we get these estimates of human PK properties. Um, so first of all, let's look at allometry from mouse. That's what we're showing here already and I've shown you that we're essentially just drawing a straight line with a slope of 0.75 between the mouse value which um, came from these properties um, and these are the calculated values for unbound so you can see now that we get through all of that the unbound clearance value for the mouse itself rather than per kilogram this is mils per minute and that's what we plot on the allometry graph and just draw a straight line to 70 kilograms for human. So that is the unbound clearance for um, uh, human. And if we uh, then calculate that back to total and per kilogram, that gets us back to this 0.54 value. I mentioned if we use RAT and recalculate, then we'll see this green line drop a bit so that it goes through the blue cross and obviously that means we get a slightly lower clearance prediction for human from using rat this time um, so if we want to make uh, the prediction of clearance from hepatocytes or microsomes if we go over to the human tab um, we put the values in here as i mentioned we can we need to select now that we're going to make the prediction from hepatocytes in this case so um, the clearance value uh, will now change um, because we're using the uh, the in vitro hepatocyte experiment. If we go over to the human in vitro tab, you'll see that these are where all the numbers are. So first of all, we have used these values, the half-life in the hepatocyte experiment, the incubation volume, and the, um, the system parameters to calculate that the clearance uh, the clint is 7.7 .7 microliters per min per million cells and then we've scaled these values and taken account of binding to come up with these values and the 0.72 is the one that you'll see um, here you'll also see that we've plotted the uh, clearance value unbound um, for the whole body. This is for 70 kilogram person taking account of binding. So this is where we take an account of binding. This is where we take an account of binding and the weight of the human. And that value of 2000 is plotted on the graph as well. So you can see how these clearance estimates relate to one another. So that is um, using hepatocytes. Similarly, we could have used microsomes to get the clearance estimate, which is going to be used in the um, those prediction. Um, we can also edit these um, checkboxes to change the values. Um, we can also edit the dose if we want to. So um, as you can see here, if we're making the rather rash assumption that we need the efficacious concentration out at 72 hours, um, we need a very high dose. If we go back to 24 hours, uh, you can see um, those comes down a bit. Uh, I mentioned the bioavailability calculation. It is possible that the bioavailability calculation will give you a figure that will lie outside the range 0 to 1. If that happens, you'll get a warning and you'll be told you need to put a check mark in this box and enter your own figure for bioavailability. 
Um, other things I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, the route of administration, you can change that to IV if you want. Obviously, that's going to essentially be um, equivalenced to a, uh, a straight, um, oops. Uh, oh, I think that's because I need to take that multiple runoff. So yeah, single run. So um, if you assume an IV route, then essentially all the compound is assumed to be dumped into the circulation immediately. It doesn't matter whether it's from a long tree or hepatocytes, because that's just affecting the clearance value. So um, oh, get rid of that. Okay. Um, and I think I've shown, oh, uh, one other thing you might see is there are two places in which you can put the um, free fraction in plasma. If you put in different values, you'll get a, a warning about that. Okay, so I think that's what I wanted to demonstrate. We just wrap up with a final couple of slides. So, We've been talking about the PK tool. This is all about um, dose prediction. We've previously talked about a tool that lets you take experimental um, PK values and calculate um, properties. So to calculate the clearance, to calculate um, the half-life, et cetera, from the um, concentration time graph in a it's raw data from a PK experiment, essentially. And PK Solver will let you do that. So there's some links to that um, tool there, which is another free tool um, in Excel. So we're talking about the, the PK tool where you're making human dose predictions. So um, this is a link to uh, the file, a PDF that pr pr provides a lot of information, including the download file, and, and, and we've got the uh, link to that in a minute. Um, so that zip file contains the executables for Windows and Mac, the source code, and instructions on how to compile a tool for yourself um, using Python if you can't use the pre-compiled versions. Worth mentioning that um, making human dose predictions is a difficult thing to do, and the PK tool makes some uh, assumptions. For example, uh, it uses a one compartment model, which means it's characterized by a linear log concentration versus time graph after the Cmax. And that can sometimes be quite a gross simplification. And um, you'll be aware possibly of more sophisticated methods that use multiple compartments. Um, so that's not what uh, the PK tool does. So if your compound and your concentration time graph looks more like this, um, possibly the PK tool isn't gonna give you particularly good estimates because we are um, assuming a, a one compartment model. Um, and of course, extrapolating PK to man can be non-trivial. So, um, you know, the absorption prediction is uncertain and can vary with dose. So we're assuming that uh, we can make predictions uh, by scaling dose. That's not always true. Um, and of course, there's PK variability between species um, beyond that, that that we've discussed, um, as well as active processes for um, uh, removing compound from uh, cells and compartments and things. Um, the protein binding differences, we do allow for taking account of that. So if you're measuring protein binding differences in vitro, um, you can at least enter that. Um, and of course, one big assumption is that we're making the assumption that hepatic extraction is the major route of clearance, and that's not always true. So if there's evidence of that, you're not gonna get good predictions from this. Of course, there are lots of other places to go for information. Um, if you do have experts to hand, very good idea to talk to them and see whether you're on the right page with uh, what you might be doing. In terms of versions of this tool, uh, version one was developed by Xenologic, um, which is part of Setara by uh, Neil and Cezanne and Tomomi. Um, and uh, especially um, the slides that are linked to in this uh, PDF where there are more um, theory slides are uh, from them. 
and obviously a lot of the ideas behind the tool are originally from them. Uh, Stavitsa has um, put together the second and third versions and they're in Python and he can be found on LinkedIn. Um, and there is uh, quite a lot more uh, documentation in this PDF that I've mentioned. And also you can find that information through the MMV website. MMV are kind enough to let us um, contribute uh, content for two of their web pages. And one of them has links to the PK tool information here if you uh, lose uh, the resources that we're mentioning here you can go back to the MMV website and you should be able to find it. Lastly uh, to download and install here's the, um, the PDF link again um, and I think Caroline's going to share the uh, zip file link with you in the chat. Um, so that PDF has linked to all the, 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 the information that you need including the zip file um, and uh, you will probably in downloading the zip file have to override your browser or your firewall or antivirus software or all three telling you not to do it because um, you know when people haven't not many people have downloaded these things then uh, you get quite a lot of warnings I certainly do but it hasn't hurt me yet <laughs>